So we're really excited to have Nenea Reeves here with us today. I'm just say a little bit about um, Nenea. She's the CEO and co-founder of Trip, a new startup that's focused on creating mood and mind-altering experiences in virtual reality. And so she's worked in digital distribution, video game tech, and app development for over 15 years. And she also has a background of practice in Vajrayana Buddhism um, and an incredible life story that she's going to share a little bit about, I think. Um, one thing I heard her say in another talk that I watched online that I really stuck with me is that she wanted to take the three things she loved the most, video games, meditation, and compassion, and put them together in a company to do something wonderful and unique. So please everyone give a warm welcome to Nenea Reeves. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm actually going to do this from here, and then I'll sit over there for questions. Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Nenea Reeves and I am CEO of TRIP and I'm going to talk to you today about psychedelic future of VR and also tell you a little bit about what we are doing at TRIP and as mentioned my own journey, I'm really just an entrepreneur and I have a strong background though in delivering solid software products that have been able to become very successful businesses and so any time I look at any of this stuff, I always think about how to have the biggest impact. Um, I'm not an expert on the use of psychedelics, and I'm certainly not a brain scientist. But that being said, given that our mission at TRIP to use technologies in ways that help people feel better, I am very interested in how our experiences affect the people who use them. And so as a result, we do spend a lot of time with researchers and scientists who are very well versed on those topics. But before we talk about VR specifically, I wanted to just talk about psychedelics in general. Um, we know from published studies that taking drugs like LSD increases activity in the visual parts of the brain. And some researchers have found that LSD appears to reduce the connections of the brain that link to a person's sense of self. And recent studies are, are now looking at how psilocybin and ayahuasca affect the brain. And the technology has actually improved to the point where we can really look more deeply into that. And now they're starting to look at what's the possible value there may be in using these substances as treatments for certain medical conditions, such as clinical depression and anxiety. So this is a, a picture from a, a recent study from this year. It was done on nerve cells in lab dishes and also on animals to show how uh, you can actually change the neuronal structure of the brain. And I don't have to tell you which neuron is the one treated with LSD in this picture. Um, but what that indicates is that psychedelics might actually be able to quickly change the structure of a brain. And then from this, if the effects are the same on humans, it hasn't been tested as such, uh, uh, the same application as this, the potential is there to create these fast acting therapeutic applications that are significantly better than what's out on the market now. And it's these therapeutic applications that are um, more in sync with our mission to help people. And it's in these use cases that I want to focus uh, the beginning part of this discussion on. So um, I know a lot of you um, are familiar with what's happening in the clinical arena and the future of psychedelics and MAPS really leading the um, uh, recent wave of advancement in this um, area of clinical usage of psychedelics. Compass Pathway just received FDA approval in August to start a psilocybin therapy a clinical trial for the treatment of, um, for the use of treatment resistance depression. And many other organizations worldwide are focusing on changing the profile of psychedelics, looking at how we can create predictable dosages and how they can be used medically. So what we want to talk about is, though, what can actually be done in VR. I mean, you hear a lot of hype about how VR is the miracle drug of the future. And um, many of these statements aren't that grounded in real validation. But there are, however, over 300 plus studies done over the last 15 to 20 years through 
very credible teams in academia working with virtual reality and its use in the mental health arena, especially in the treatment of anxiety and other psychiatric disorders such as PTSD, pain management, and the like. So we are really understanding the effects of VR on the brain and it's getting more and more sophisticated in how we can measure that. And unlike therapeutic psychedelics, VR doesn't have a lot of the hurdles of legality, dosage regulation and controls, and one's individual neurochemistry conflicting with its efficacy. So what are people doing in VR currently in this area? Well, you do see a lot of 360 videos of psychedelic trip simulations, a lot of them using Google's Deep Dream technology, and this might be enjoyable under certain conditions, but they really don't have the same transformative effect of actually taking a substance. Uh, and this was really clarified by the hallucina uh, hallucination machine created out of the University of Sussex in the UK. It, it also uses Google's Deep Dream uh, algorithms to manipulate video and Participants were taken through a questionnaire after the experience, and the feedback was that while the visual hallucination references experience were similar to classical psychedelics, they weren't able to really evoke that temporal distortion or those disruptions of self, the ego dissolution that are commonly experienced in altered states uh, uh, triggered by substances. And those are the experiences that are transformative. But the key difference, and the one to look at more closely, is that unlike substance-induced states where your serotonin channels are being altered by chemicals, the sensory perceptions humans experience in VR are all happening during complete consciousness. So it's almost like you're overlaying realities on top of the reality you're actually experiencing. So while many are making claims in the use of VR as a consciousness altering substance, there is still quite a bit of research and validation to be done in the area. And our team is very conservative about the claims we'll make. Real validation does take time and a tremendous capital commitment. And I think our community really needs to learn from the initial or the previous wave of, of uh, research in psychedelics in that same way that we need to be very responsible in this area about how we apply and to be cautious about the claims that we make so we don't thwart progress. Um, but that doesn't mean there are, aren't opportunities for what we call VR psychedelics. Um, some of the immediate use cases to consider specific to the clinical usage of psychedelics is perhaps to use VR experiences as combination therapies with controlled substances. So you take, for example, a person who has no experience taking hallucination, uh, hallucinogens. They could be prepared better for the clinical setting by exposing them to a VR onboarding simulation of the experience they're about to have. I've been told um, by some people already working in the clinical usage of uh, psychedelics that a lot of people who've never done them before will experience panic attacks, especially in the first one to two sessions. They might get a little more used to it by the third session. So we could use VR as a way to ease them into the experience and reduce a lot of their anxiety. Um, Another application could be to apply a short VR session to the clinical patient during their psychedelic session rather um, than giving them the musical playlist as the take-home therapy, which is often the, the practice now. You could connect the brain with the VR experience while they're under the influence with the therapist, and then they could take that home as their take-home therapy uh, and it's a much more personalized VR experience. It makes that same session connection, but in a much more immersive manner. So this could look like putting the person, um, uh, uh, well, simply like using a product like Trip or Sound Self while they're under the influence for a few minutes to make that brain connection. Um, 
So we know we're not the only company working on experiences that could help a lot of other people. There are great teams working in this space. I know some of them are here tonight. Um, we've all spent time together in hot tubs and uh, <laughs> have talked well into the wee hours of the night about this. Um, some are developing and executing their vision through experience uh, that span like Job and Robin are doing with self-care entertainment uh, at Orpheus, um, uh, straight up entertainment or uh, going into just clinical and therapeutic applications and uh, you also see a lot of immersive mindfulness environments and I really um, feel that the more companies we have in this space the more innovative and ultimately as we all get business traction the more support we'll have in the venture and financial community to support our ideas and that's how we can really drive a lot of change. Uh, Josh and I were talking earlier before this started that um, because I tend to look at things from a, the lens of how does this scale and how can it become a business, I think the biggest um, impact a community like Cohack can have is to take your talents out and get them into arenas where you can reach a lot of people. And um, we're on the wave of something really magical happening now when you see very conservative companies implementing mindfulness training programs as an employee wellness offering. There's something definitely in the air. And I think that's an opportunity where we can come in with very consumable experiences that might not freak people out too much and get them to start uh, thinking about their relationship to the world around them a little more consciously. So um, I'm gonna uh, show you a video from my uh, uh, co-founding partner Zach Norman and he'll tell you what he thinks trip is and uh, um, and then I'll take it from there all right so well let's trip is a mood on demand platform that's powered by VR it's great at giving people who are stressed out and otherwise not calm a moment of respite from their busy day put it on their head use it for eight to ten minutes and come out feeling calm and refreshed and ready to attack the next challenge that they see in the day. It's designed to elicit a response similar to that someone gets while meditating, but it does it in a fully turnkey way where a user simply needs to put on the headset and start the software and they're guided to a state that focuses their mind and it does it by using the flow state generated by gameplay, certain audio stimulation like binaural audio, and by encouraging correct breathing. Okay, so um, we will have a couple units set up afterwards that people can try the experience. It's about eight minutes long. So if you're gonna be at the Trans Tech Conference, we'll have several units there going for the next two days. Um, Zach and I have worked together multiple times with great success. Uh, we started a mobile game company. A lot of the team uh, has worked with us. We have um, multiple times. We have uh, new team members, Mani Srinivasan, who's here, and Justin Beretta from the Glitch Mob has been doing our music. And it's really been a labor of love. Um, I really do believe that the, the team you build shows up in the end product. And, we have a wonderful team and I'm really proud of, of what we've done over the last year, even though it's early stage. I met Mikey a year ago right after we got funded and um, we came up with the concept after a trip to Orange County to try a very early version of the Oculus Rift. Um, my friend and former colleague, Brendan Uribe, who was the founding CEO of Oculus, I was an investor in, CE, uh, in Oculus. Um, he invited me and my cousin and Zach and my late husband, Vic, who's in this picture with Brendan. Um, it was such a mind-blowing experience for all of us. And Zach and I, just the whole way home, said, We've got, we have to make something for this. Um, I think the uh, um, thing that moved us about VR was the immersion of it. That's really the native inherent property. We made a little solitaire app. You can download it on uh, uh, most platforms still. 
but it was right after this visit that my husband Vic um, was diagnosed with liver cancer and we were told that we had eight months together and we ended up only having eight weeks and it was very very devastating to our whole family he was an amazing person he had a very deep meditation practice um, that he got directly from the Dalai Lama in India and uh, he evolved it by traveling all throughout Bhutan and Nepal and India and ended up in a cave in Tibet um, where he met this monastery that had been uh, destroyed during the Cultural Revolution and he came back with this mission to rebuild that monastery and he did it. And he decided to dedicate his life to the preservation of uh, the Tibetan culture and their meditation practice. And it was a gift he gave to me. I, I don't meditate nearly as much as he does. I, I probably do about an hour and a half to two hours a day. He did twice that. Um, I've found ways to hack meditation. I do 30 to 40 in the morning and 30 to 40 at night and several five to 10 minute chunks throughout the day. And when you try trip, you'll realize it's kind of based on that methodology that was given to me by a very high level Lama in Tibet to do small chunks throughout the day so you have these little resting points to land on that uh, are like reset buttons that can connect you. I had never done it that way. I'd only done the 20 minutes in the morning, jump in my car, and become a total asshole by about three blocks away. So um, when he had me break it down into those small chunks, I started to see the transformative effect. And that really informed the way that we designed TRIP to be these little mini breaks that you can jump into in eight to 10 minute sessions. We're gonna start working on some five minute sessions as well. Um, but after uh, um, Vic died, uh, and I will say just something about Brendan, um, who has really pioneered this space. He was also a longtime supporter of Vic's nonprofit and continues to support it to this day. When Vic, um, his last wish was that this girl's school be completed in Tibet that would teach uh, nomadic girls how to use computers, speak English and Chinese so they could be more viable as well as their own language. And he was, um, you know, uh, had so much regret that it wasn't done before he died. And so we finished it last January and Brendan's been supporting its annual run. Um, and it means a lot to me to have his support as a friend and as a colleague in this space. Um, so uh, it took me about a year to emerge from that experience. And when you have that kind of grief and, and loss, which, you know, loss is something that connects a lot of us, I started to think about how do I rebuild my life? And it was a life that I knew I was gonna build a new found, uh, uh, life on, but it was on a foundation of great love a strong meditation practice, an amazing community of support that spanned not only my personal life, but also my business life. And I started to ask myself in my morning meditation, what kind of company do I want to build? You know, what can I do with all these things that I know that have helped me throughout life's challenges and create something meaningful and beneficial? And it was from that headspace that the idea from TRIP um, evolved. So Zach and I started to um, craft this concept of creating an engine that gives you agency over how you feel. And we raised our first round of funding from uh, our, the visionary, most visionary venture capitalist in this space I've ever met. His name is Tim Chang, he's at Mayfield. And uh, uh, also Presence Capital, they've been very like-minded individuals who are driven to support initiatives like ours. We all have this common goal of trying to help people with, their, with our efforts. And it's been an amazing year building trip and my only regret is that my husband Vic didn't get to see what we built because I know he would have loved it. Um, so trip is, uh, it's not a VR meditation app. It's not a psychedelic simulation. 
It's a catalog of experiences that are crafted to help you change how you feel. And all of that is powered by this procedural platform that learns through user interactions and will dynamically create experiences that are beneficial to the user. And our first experience is done. The platform has been built and you can try, uh, some of you can try it during the breakout sessions and as I mentioned at the TransTech conference tomorrow. Um, but how do, how do we create this experience? We do this by incorporating um, uh, a few elements, um, interactive flow triggers as Zach mentioned, breath visualization, guided meditation, we have um, visual components and sound frequencies in, in adaptive soundscapes um, that Justin and Matt Davis did. And then when you take the immersion of VR, which is that native property, it has this multiplying effect on all of those components. And because you know we are business people, we also wanted the app to retain a user's engagement level by changing the experience daily. We built a mobile app that will help to drive that engagement and our biggest focus now is expanding our catalog to bring new trip types that target more emotions and more um, states of being. And you know it's important for us to measure efficacy of our experience so we start by bookending each session by asking the user to self-report on how they feel and with that, we calculate what we call uh, an emotional well-being score. And over time, when our mobile app comes out, you can sync your uh, biometric data um, so we can get inputs mapping to that score. And the mobile app also helps you personalize the experience in a way that I'll talk about in a little bit more. And uh, we'll also use it to drive um, community engagements. But you know, when I talked about those VR trip simulations, part of the problem is that you're just getting visual inputs and it's a canned visual experience. And our, we really felt that for this to be truly innovative, the platform has to create the experience to you. And it's gonna um, learn over time. We need many more users using it to get that a neural network really prime tuned, but it's built so it will generate the experience to the end user. So that gets it closer to the way these chemicals work with your own chemical structure. Um, so these interfaces of telling us how you like the experience and how it made you feel are all training the AI and the machine learning layer that we we're building and evolving over time. Um, our first deployment is, um, I mentioned the mobile app, and, uh, but our first deployment is uh, at RISE LA. We launched about two months ago. It's a substance abuse outpatient clinic in LA. They brought TRIP in as a grounding tool for clients to use before group therapy. And they came up with their own use case, so that's something that we've seen throughout. They wanted 10 units so they could have all 10 clients use it before they go into group therapy and they use it as a grounding um, exercise. And they had such a positive response that we can measure a 31% increase in their emotional well-being. And you can see on the left, when they start off the experience, they're selecting worried, tense, upset, and when they end uh, the experience, they select calm, inspired, and relaxed. When you see these moods, we do randomize them for um, uh, position bias, uh, and they get uh, they show up every session. Our data uh, collection also maps to existing cognitive behavioral um, mood mapping data sets. It was designed for us and with us um, uh, with uh, Walter Greenleaf at Stanford and the National Mental Health Innovation Center at University of Colorado, um, and. Uh, they're also participating in an extended data collection process that we worked out with those entities. We're tracking their stress and craving levels um, of the RISE LA clients on a weekly basis and then we can map that data to our own session data. And it was really exciting, even though it's still a small audience and we want to scale this program out more broadly, it was very moving to me to um, 
uh, have this be our very first launch. My, I lost my sister five years ago to a drug overdose, and like many of us, you know, have had several friends and family members struggle with addiction problems throughout the years. And um, so we take our company, uh, we focus on three phases of growth. We're trying to have the biggest impact. The first one is uh, we're bringing it into corporations right now. We just signed our very first big enterprise customer, so conservative, and I can't believe that they are, they're really excited about TRIP and we're excited that they're bringing it into their company. Um, it's, uh, then we'll scale it out into a personal version and uh, our ultimate goal is to get involved in the therapeutic arena so that we can have the broadest reach and the biggest impact. Um, and it's uh, something also we will all, um, participate in research studies. This is ongoing because it's an important feedback loop for us on the evolution of our product and our impact overall. And again, it goes back to that statement that we really want to have uh, substantive data. We want to be able to make claims we can really stand behind. And uh, so how we collect data and how we work with ap academia and the scientific and medical community is very important. Um, so this is what it looks like in a company. This is an activation at a corporation that we did recently that did lead to a contract. And uh, we have a point of presence. We have this cool little trip cart. And you can buy multiple units of it. And we send you stuff so you can get rid of germs and everybody can be um, uh, mindfully taking breaks throughout their day. Um, and you know, it's interesting because we're talking about this shift out there. Mindfulness is now very mainstream. A company like Aetna um, uh, brought a mindfulness training program in through eMindful, and they were actually able to quantify a $3,000 savings in employees who uh, um, uh, participated in the mindfulness training program, and, and their productivity increase also contributed to the company's bottom line. And of course, Silicon Valley companies have been leading the charge, but. I'm very excited when I see companies like Aetna and others scaling out because it means that there's an opportunity for real transformation to happen. Um, and you know, people do are starting to understand that mental well-being and emotional well-being is just as important as physical. Um, uh, there is a lot of money lost through increased accidents, uh, stressed out workers, productivity losses and uh, absenteeism, it has a real cost to it. Um, but the companies that roll out best practice programs in that include mindfulness training, resiliency training, happiness programs, they have, there's data that maps to a significant stock appreciation in those companies when they're benchmarked against the S&P 500. So we're very excited about our ability as a company to offer a beneficial solution uh, in ways that are innovative and fun and exciting, and then eventually we'll scale out into other arenas. And I also think that um, it's a way, as I mentioned, for us to get this transformative state of mind happening. You know, people will approach meditation initially for their own um, benefit. They'll say, I want to be more focused. I want to be less stressed. I want to be calmer. But everyone I know who has a dedicated practice that they do consistently over time has this shift in their perception where it goes from self to the world around them. And that's when I start seeing life-changing decision framework being put in place where people, I saw it happen in my husband, where he decided he wanted to have more impact on the world and, and do something more meaningful. And I saw that in my own process of how I wanted to evolve my work life and my career track towards something that could have more impact. So that's our, our secret goal, is to plant those seeds at a place where people are the most unhappy which is oftentimes, you know, where they're spending their day at work. 
Um, and this was really validated for me this weekend. I was in Honolulu, and that's where I'm from, and uh, that's where I get the weird Hawaiian name that, you know, it's funny, I didn't realize the definition, Nanea means, Hawaiians always have three meanings to a word. It's always in context, so that's why aloha will mean hello, goodbye, and I love you. It can also, at its highest level, mean the spirit and the heart of the people and the land. Um, Nanea means very casually um, peacefulness and serenity, to feel very content and lose track of time, completely fascinated in an activity you love to do. And somebody said, oh, that's flow state. Um, I was always told that meaning was like, it, my grandmother used to call it utter fa uh, utterly fascinated where you're just so fascinated in usually a solo activity that you just lose track of, of everything. And, um, but anyway, I was in Honolulu and I shared trip with my friend Ron who's in this picture. He's uh, nearing end of life from cancer, liver cancer, the same disease that took my husband. And Ron's been given 90 days to live um, by his doctor. I suspect he might, um, uh, go past that expiration date. Um, but after doing trip, he insisted on buying a device on spot. I, I wouldn't sell it to him, but um, he said it really helped him with his perception of his upcoming journey. And it was all I could do just to, um, it was very moving, not only for me, but everyone else who was there. And so our team was very inspired by his reaction and they loaded a device for him that also personalized the experience in trip. At the end of the experience, they, we have what we call these amaze balls, and <laughs> you can upload photos from your life. And so they put life, uh, they took images from his Facebook page and, and put them in for him. And um, when, you, when you look at the experience and it randomly takes from your own life, um, if you see images that aren't of your own life, the mobile app will tell you who contributed to your trip. And uh, so you can gift your images to other people's trips. And so it's that kind of innovation we're trying to explore, how to create more connections, um, uh, how to help people like Ron, you know, deal with different journeys in their life. Um, uh, I'm, I'm excited to hear his response, um, uh, how he'll feel when he sees that. And, um, you know, it's, it's experiences like this and the data that we see coming in from Rise LA that lets us know that we are on to something here. And that's really our focus, to create experiences that are beneficial to people and that can eventually scale to evolving to real transformation. And I think many of us in this space are interested in creating, you know, we're not interested in creating acid trip simulations, but, you know, using our skills and our talents to move this into a space of something even better. And the person I, that really inspired me in, in our field is Microsoft researcher Mar Gonzalez Franco when she said that VR has the ability to retrain perception and potentially create super senses. And that's, um, uh, that's exciting to me. You know, we could think about how to evolve that experience that Ron had to really help someone with the end of life and, and all that's around that and, and overlay different layers of reality on top of the reality that you're having now. Um, so I'd like to end uh, this before opening up with questions um, with a video of some user testimonials. It was from a focus group we had at our one year anniversary. We've been working for one year on this uh, and it's really been an incredible, incredible experience. Um, I'm excited about the future, not only for us, but of overall of using technology to help people expand their perception of the world around it and their experience with it. Meditation, it takes a lot of effort to get into the head space, but this thing it helps you get into it directly, which is awesome. I 
I feel enlightened. I don't know, that's for the term that word's coming to my head, almost spiritual. That was just beautiful. Oh, wow. It definitely took you out of the real world and put you into a world which was a combination of objects and shapes you're familiar with, sounds that you're familiar with, but it was a genesis of those shapes into forms that were relaxing. What I really dug about it was the uh, composition of the experience itself was way more powerful than just the technology or the beauty or the images or the, the sound. It was actually the narrative that I was taken through and the personal experience I was encouraged to have was something that I've wanted to see in VR and felt like is very needed for humans. I really enjoyed the breathing techniques, seeing the exhalation and the inhalation. The explosion of geometry into the butterflies. It's like, you know, the tattoo I got have here is a combination of religion and technology, this sort of conflict that exists. And that's what I saw with the geometry is sort of the science and then the butterflies is just natural life. Cool. <laughs> if I had the opportunity to use it at home, I would totally go for it, like probably every day. <laughs> when you start your day, you know, just putting it up, take a moment to meditate and yeah. The balance of being in a beautiful world, but also providing something to focus on was very effective. I like the idea you could incorporate that into a morning meditation ritual sort of thing. I love the fact that you could just sit down and pop it on and chill out. I would use this anywhere. If I could pull over in the car and throw it on for five minutes. I struggle with normal meditation. So this is right up my alley of like a guided experience. I would definitely use Trip at Home before I sleep. The Calm program that I just experienced, it's in itself a spiritual practice that you can actually experience in the digital world. That was definitely the best VR experience I've had. Welcome to Trip. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Okay, so I think uh, we have a few minutes before the breakout, right? You guys will um, let me know. And uh, uh, Josh, you'll give us the cutoff sign, right? Um, so yeah, if I can answer some questions. You have to film me, though, wearing these things, because <laughs> my friends Please will wait for the mic. really love that. Yes. Thank you. When you say s when super sense, can you think of examples that come to mind about that? Well, yes. Um, it's, it's something that after I read that quote, I thought, you know, what does that mean? I don't think I personally have been able to answer that question. But I think in VR in general, the tendency, and you even see that with some of these acid trip simulations, is to simulate what we already know here. And I think the true wave of innovation is to create new things that you can't experience here. And, um, uh, so, you know, we know some of the things that happen in psychedelics is uh, you have the ability to hear. I've heard stories of um, uh, hearing ants moving and, and them actually even being able to validate that. Um, so I think that's in the area. Um, I don't think the tech is at the level where it can affect us just yet at that level. But I would imagine in about five or six years, we'll have devices that have fidelity that'll feel much closer to our own um, uh, experience. Because right now, it's still very much outside in, coming in. But I think as the tech evolves, it'll feel more like it's coming from you. Um, we need much higher fidelity for that. This thing is a little weird. Can I get a regular chair? I feel like, I, I feel like one of those bouncy things. <laughs> um, great, thank you. Yes. Hi. Uh, um, 
so like I look at this and I think because I can't meditate. Right. Right. I just can't. Right. But I look at this and I think, oh my God, I totally can meditate. If right. Matters. Like I want this like now. Right. However, what I worry about and wondering if sorry, thanks, good looking out. Um I worry about and, and wondering, obviously, because you've been doing this for so long. Right. W will it become a crutch almost that you need that to meditate? And and e maybe it's the case where big deal. So that becomes the crutch for meditation. Like, yeah. What, I mean, what do you, you think about that? I think everybody, one thing I've noticed with Trip, at least for now is that people start to find their own use cases for it. We're even seeing that in the companies we're deploying in. Um, I don't see it as a um, replacement for meditation. I use it at night before my nighttime practice where my head is much louder and it's always harder for me to get into it. So I find it kind of as a, uh, a sort of a decom tool, as it were. Um, but for those people like my partner, Zach, who don't have a daily practice, I really see it as an onboarding mechanism <laughs> for that. He ended up uh, spending the weekend up in Ojai with Ram Das. I never thought I would see that day. Do you know? So my secret plan is working, and uh, you start with the people around you. But um, yeah, I, we're hoping that it becomes more of a mechanism. Now, because it's delivered from the server, we can identify patterns of abuse um, and usage, so you know we can control. We can cut off the supply if we have to, so. <laughs> but, you know, there's a lot of data that shows in, in traditional psychedelics, you know, you give a rat cocaine, it'll keep going back to it until it's dead. You give it LSD, it will never go back to get more. So, <laughs> um, I, I don't think, I think that the short um, version of it is what's the effective dose. Um, and that was what Lama Karwang gave me in Tibet. Because I said the same thing. I, I, can, I can do 20 minutes, but it doesn't, it's not helping me. I don't know if it has any benefit. And when he said, just do five minutes and then add another five minutes and do more throughout the day. So I just started to hack my meetings where I would um, not book a meeting for 50 to 60 minutes, it's 45 minutes go do a bio break, get some tea, get in the next room and sit for 10 minutes. You can get an extra hour of meditation in your day just by doing that. We'd love Trip to be kind of a helpful tool for that. Um, one person that we're talking to to help us evolve the experience actually gave us a great idea to black out the environment, almost sensory deprivation, to allow the person to kind of you know, be able to go in and out and start to develop that muscle to be able to sit quietly. And I thought that was a great, great um, uh, contribution to a potential design for kind of meditation training. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you, in the back. Yep, you looking all around, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you mentioned that uh, it will adapt to the user through some sort of um, survey feedback me mechanism. Mm -hmm. Is it possible through some sort of uh, moder monitoring of the user's mood mm -hmm. and or brain waves or something mm -hmm. that it could adapt in real time? Yeah, the, definitely. There are many iterations to come in the future on these devices. So uh, if we can get... Um, the user to tie their health kit data in through the mobile app or the Android wearable um, through the mobile app, we can get those inputs um, from Fitbit, any, any um, wearable that has an open API, and start to get, as I mentioned, biometric inputs. That will all start to train the data. We um, have breath visualization. It will eventually tie to your own breath and give you a feedback on what's optimal and help you get there over time. And that has a huge benefit to the person doing it. Um, and then there are um, devices of the future and some even now, but they're um, not at the consumer level. If you can track eye, changes, pupil and iris changes. It's a, 
um, very um, detailed mapping to emotions and mood. Um, you could put sensors here to get heart rate variability, um, get a, a pretty clean read here. Um, we're experimenting with the Neurable device. They just released a new data update. Um, so you get the back of the head so you can get some fairly good EEG um, uh, reads on that. And they've got some mood profiling that they're evolving. And uh, um, so I, it's not quite turnkey and seamless yet, but I think what's indicative of some of the things that Muse is doing and other companies like Neurable, et cetera, eventually we'll get consumer versions. Um, I remember at the TransTech conference last year hearing Mary Lou Jepson talk about the portable fMRI stuff that she's working on. I, I can't wait, right? So because then you're getting real-time adjustment. And the good news is our platform is built to be adaptive and, and it's a procedural creation. So if we have that feedback, then it creates it on the fly. That's the vision. We're not there just yet, but we're ready. <laughs> we're ready for it, yeah. And the AI is really important. Um, so we're just building in little um, uh, strings, uh, you know, little Python code, neural network, um, neural nets uh, to start learning. And we've got the data process flow in place to do it. But I would imagine it's probably going to take about two years to train that data accurately. Enough. Yep. I'll, uh, there's a couple hands in the back. There's one, one up more. here, too. There's, I think there's one more. OK. Um, we have, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I had a question related to what you just mentioned about uh, the AI and the update experiences for the individuals yes. using this platform. Um, so the data that will be collected and used to train this AI is very personal data, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, are you uh, worried about the privacy of that data or mm -hmm. is that something you're focused on at the moment? For sure, for sure. So we, um, we get a separate biometric opt-in. We're GDPR compliant. Um, and the user has all of that. They have they have the ability to delete their data. They don't have to opt in um, to do that, and they can just have an anonymous session and not give us any feedback. So that's um, there. You know, working in the games industry, we know all the bad things that can happen. Um, you know, th those fil those image uploads, we're already checking for phone numbers and fleshy objects and all kinds of things that could poke you in the eye, and. Uh, <laughs> Um, and we escrow those images. So yes, we are concerned about it, um, but we're being responsible. Yeah, but it's a good question. Thank you. Okay, well we have uh, one up here and a couple over there, so if we do them fast, we can get them all. Thanks. Um, uh, you mentioned the case of the hallucination machine and how it's limited and that it's uh, mainly a visual experience. It doesn't have the I, I'm not saying it was limited, but that was their finding was it couldn't trigger those other things. Yeah. So I wanted to. I'm curious about your thoughts on VR and ego dissolution. Do you think Trip gets closer to that? What do you think the ingredients are to question your identity and your preferences? And I think um, it's something that we know from the games industry that um, in order to make a good game, you have to kind of get the user into a flow state. And that skill challenge ratio, those gameplay mechanics can kind of get you into a mindset where you lose track of time. I mean, it's why video games are so popular and they can be very addicting. Um, so it's that feedback loop we think is one area to look in. Um, I think you can if it's interactive. If it's just being fed to you, it's a little harder. So it's the interactivity, I think, is the thing that focuses your attention. And if you can do some things, like when you try trip, you'll see we do floating and movement in a way that kind of gives you a new spatial um, sense. So we're gonna explore more of that. Our next experience has a lot of the levitation 
um, experience associated with breath. And so we're gonna go a little deeper into that. We've had a lot of requests for things like, we've asked people, what do you want us to build next? Because now the platform's done, we, it's all just recipes. Um, we get asked for bad trips a lot. <laughs> but those are from my East Side LA, um, Silver Lake kind of artsy friends, so I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I think, we're, I think we're out of time. Okay. So let's, let's give one more hand to Nenea. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you.